Good morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. You're very welcome to join us on The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. Inflation forecast to hit a 50-year high of just over 18% in January, causing more hardship for millions of us. Charities warn that rising prices will force people to make choices between buying food and heating their homes. Gas prices soared by 37% yesterday after Russia said it would shut down a critical pipeline to Europe for three days for maintenance. Energy boss Bill Bolin is calling for the Conservative Party to end its leadership race and focus on the cost of living instead. We'll speak to him later on. And we'll ask Government Minister Chloe Smith about the growing pressure on Liz Truss to explain what she'll do to support struggling families. It's Tuesday the 23rd of August. Forecasters warn that inflation is entering the stratosphere driven by a surge in gas prices and rising energy bills. Police have launched a murder investigation after a nine-year-old girl is shot dead in Liverpool. More misery for travellers. I'm at Heathrow where British Airways has cancelled more than 10,000 flights in its winter schedule. Ukraine rejects accusations by Moscow that it was behind a car bomb that killed the daughter of one of Putin's close allies. Dockers, bin men and barristers all out on strike. We'll be speaking to Sharon Graham. She's the boss of one of Britain's biggest unions about the wave of industrial action. Cheers turn to cheers at Old Trafford as United inflict Liverpool's first league defeat of the year. Also coming up on the programme for you this morning, wherever you're watching us around the world, saving a scent to save a life, the unusual fragrance campaign to help sniffer dogs find missing people. Yeah. And we'll hear from DJ superstar Paul Oakenfold, who's played from Ibiza to Everest Base Camp, about how living with dyslexia has shaped his life and his career. Morning, everybody. Inflation expected to hit its highest level in nearly 50 years. Experts warned that prices could rise by 18.6% in January, which would leave millions of families struggling to put food on the table or heat their homes. The boss of one energy company is calling on the Conservative Party to end its leadership contest and focus on dealing with the crisis. We'll hear from the government in just a moment. But first, let's tell you about a nine-year-old girl who has been shot dead in Liverpool. Merseyside police have launched a murder investigation. Officers were called to a house in Kincheth Heath Avenue, which is in the Notty Ash area of the city, at 10 o'clock last night. A statement from the police said they were responding to reports that a man had fired a gun inside a property. The child was shot in the chest and taken to hospital in a critical condition where she later died. The force said a man also suffered gunshot wounds to his body and a woman suffered an injury to her hand during the incident. They've both been taken to hospital. The assistant chief constable, that's uh, Jenny Sims, described it as a truly shocking incident in which, tragically, a young and innocent girl has been shot and sadly died. She urged anyone who knows anything to come forward and speak to the police and appealed for dash cam or mobile phone footage from anyone who was visi visiting, I should say, the area last night. We'll bring you more on that incident as we get it. Joined now by Chloe Smith, the Minister of State for Disabled People, Work and Health. Hi, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme this morning. Here to talk about a one-off disability payment of, I think, £150. How far do you expect that to go? Can I first of all say how really sad that news is from Liverpool and, and my thoughts just go out to the, the family. Um, the news we're talking about this morning is really important actually to support disabled people and it comes on top of the uh, whole package that the government has put in place to support people on the cost of living. So actually in totality what we're looking at is the 8 million most vulnerable households in the country receiving at least £1,200. So all in all I hope this is of serious help to people in the face of rising pressures, which, of course, the government acknowledges. How far do you expect this £150 to go? Well, it will make a contribution, of course, and it comes on top of, as I say, 
the other support as well. So, for example, £400 to all households on energy bills. So, in the context of the kinds of costs that disabled people face, this, I hope, will make a real contribution to what people are facing. The reason I'm asking you, Minister, is because we have spoken to um, a young man, a disabled man, who doesn't want to give his name for obvious reasons. We spoke to him a week ago. He said he doesn't, I'm quoting him, does not expect to be alive this spring because of the scary cost of energy bills. Well, obviously, I'm very sorry to hear him say that, and that's a very uh, concerning thing for somebody to say. In that context, I would certainly hope that all of the staff at job centres and in other parts of the welfare system are there to support him as they should be. And, of course, what uh, a person may well be eligible for uh, by means of this payment links to other benefits that they would already be getting. So, for example, personal independence payments or employment and support allowance. So there is, of course, the breadth of the welfare system there to support that particular person or others in a similar uh, similar uh, set of circumstances. And what the government is saying today is that in addition to those normal parts of the welfare system, there is this support available in terms of the cost of living because we recognise those rising pressures and it's important to have acted, which is what the government is doing. Inflation at 19% by January. These are very troubling figures and the government ag agrees that these are very worrying figures and that's why we're acting with this package. And of course that's part of having acted already, so those who are on means-tested benefits, again for example employment and support allowance, will have received already payments and that adds up to uh, over £1,200. If inflation is at 19% by January, um, Liz Truss, who you support, is still saying that a, a recession is not necessarily inevitable. She seems to be the only person that's saying that at the moment. Well, I don't think uh, I don't think uh, she's she's alone in making the argument that actually. Do you uh, agree with her? I do agree with her because Why? I do agree with her because what we need to focus on first of all is to be able to grow the economy and she's been really clear that that is her strategy and I think that's right because growing the economy will in turn uh, raise tax receipts and that is of course what enables us to run the public services that will support the person you've given the example of and many others so I do agree with her absolutely that this is the right overall strategy but I know that she is also keenly aware of the pressures that people are facing and that's why she said she wouldn't rule out doing more but she has to have the full data in her hands. But the tax cuts that she's talking about will not benefit the least well off in this country. And that's why she said she wouldn't rule out doing more but again she has to have the full data in her hands. If she's lucky enough to become Prime Minister in a few weeks time she would be able to look at the entire picture and she said that she would be uh, putting forward an emergency budget and that's where I would expect those decisions to be made. Um, as far as an emergency budget is concerned just looking at my notes here um, she re reportedly planning that emergency budget in September uh, next month. Um, I think I'm right in saying. Am I right in saying that? I believe so. Yeah, OK. Um, the OBR is giving an official forecast. The Treasury Committee Chair, Mel Stride, said she's flying blind without having a forecast to work off. She, she doesn't want that or she, she's changing her mind? I think, to be fair, uh, Kay, you might be trying to run several arguments at once here because if you well, were which to... Which one would you like to take you, first? If you were to say that inflation is ra rising as you, as you did at the beginning of this interview and obviously we expect the price cap information to come in this Friday, there is already a building picture there. What Liz has said on the OBR point in particular is that she wouldn't wish to uh, delay any further by waiting for that... They say they're ready to go. They're very she, happy to provide she her will, with one. She will have to be able to be in position and take the data that is available. And within that context, she then wants to be able to work as quickly as possible. But the OBR have said that they will offer an official forecast um, and uh, she's saying she doesn't want one. Uh, is that right? She, she's saying she would want to be able to use all the data that is very available when she were to become Prime Minister. So you and I are sitting here somewhat in advance of that. I would love Liz Truss to become Prime Minister for reasons that I've been uh, very clear on, and I think she has a really clear plan and a bold vision. But she will have to have all of that data available at that time then to be able to make her decisions. Tell me about her bold vision. What's she going to do to help people? Well, in the context of uh, the cost of living, of course, she will be, uh, she will be um, continuing to support the actions that the government has already 
taken. And it's much, much more than that. And Minister. in the context of, uh, and, and, and the, the information I'm bringing to you this morning, of course, afresh, is that the disability payments, the £150 that uh, we began by talking about, those will be rolling out from the 20th of September, so I hope that that new information is of uh, some comfort to people. Drop in that the is part of a plan that gets over £1,200 into the household, into the pockets of the households uh, where most vulnerable people live. Now, that's really important action. In addition to that, as I've already mentioned, uh, Liz Truss, if she were to become Prime Minister, has said, she, has said that she doesn't rule out further help uh, for what does that the most look like? vulnerable. I can't answer that for you, as you well know, Kate, because that would be the subject of her emergency budget. That's what people but want to know. Indeed they do, and they will have to keep watching your programme and others as the autumn yeah, but they're not going to necessarily on. vote for her, are they, unless they know what she's what she What Liz for. has already set out clearly is... That not she, enough. What Liz has already set out very clearly is that she wants to focus on growing the economy. And I think that's actually really important also in the con context of the cost of living, because people do want to be able to have a job in which they earn to be able to support themselves and their households. And Liz has spoken, and I think rightly, about wanting to be able to focus on helping people keep money in their pockets for themselves rather than removing it in taxes and returning it in benefits. What's she and I think that's perfectly okay. fair. What's she going to do about the energy price cap? Because quite a few energy bosses think that it should be frozen and uh, obviously it's going to be looked at again and soon and then also next January. At, th at least three energy bosses that I could quote to you, you know them already, four actually, um, are saying that the, the price uh, should be capped, should be frozen. Um, if they want it, surely she should want it. I'm aware of those arguments and, in, and indeed, for example, so the Labour Party also makes the argument that actually there should be a, a, a type of a freeze. I worry that those are short-term solutions only. So I think what we so do she's need... she's not going to do that. I think what we do need to look at is the longer-term solutions about how to bring energy prices down. And there you need to think about energy security and there you would also need to think, I think, about the ways that we uh, interact with somebody like uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia, whose actions have been a main part of driving those prices up and driving those pressures up. Now, in Elizabeth Truss, you have somebody who's been, I think, the clearest of all in saying that we should stand up to uh, Putin uh, for the bully that he is. But she's also been clear that in other ways she will deal with energy prices. So, for example, removing the levy that people pay. And that will take £150 off bills. Now, on top of that, she's also, uh, of course, going to be listening to the likes of Kwasi Kwarteng, who has been working in government already about further things that can be Her done. Her new Chancellor. Potentially, that's for her to decide. But this brings me back to the main point. She, will, she would be in a position to make those decisions if she became Prime Minister. So she's I not said, ruling it out? I certainly Is she ruling she it would. out? You've already heard her say that she doesn't rule out further support. And I think that's right. Now, what I'm here to talk about this morning is how we're supporting disabled people with £150 and that that is coming on stream in September. That is really important and sits alongside the opportunities for growth that we also hope Will benefit disabled people because I was talking only last week uh, in studios <coughs> uh, around um, around the way that we're helping more people into employment and that is vital. Okay, good to talk to you. Sadly, we're Thank out you. of time. It's great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, the cost of living fills many of the front pages again this morning. Uh, the Financial Times, let's start there, reporting that gas prices could be among the factors to propel inflation beyond. 18% next year. The Times also leads on soaring inflation, saying it could hit a 50-year high. While the Express asks, how will millions cope if prices keep on rising? And the I saying that Liz Truss has come under fire for backtracking on her promise of an emergency budget if she gets into number 10 instead of downgrading to a so-called fiscal event. Meantime, let's turn to disruption at the airports. British Airways has torn up its winter schedule and cancelled 10,000 flights between late October and March of next year. Maddie is at Heathrow Airport for us this morning. Hi, Maddie. Where will this all end? Good morning, Kay. Who knows? It feels like that uh, those flight cancellations, which have really blighted the summer holiday period for so many, are continuing and will set look set to continue for months now with this announcement from BA. They are cancelling some 629 short-haul round trips from Heathrow up till the 29th of October. That's 
about 1,200 individual flights and then making further changes to their winter schedule up to March next year. Some 8% or 10,000 flights affected there. Now, BA say that they're giving passengers plenty of notice here. This will allow them to prioritise that key autumn half-term getaway period um, and while they have to comply with the passenger cap that Heathrow Airport has enforced. 100,000 passengers a day, that is the cap Heathrow Airport has introduced and extended just last week until the end of October. Um, any passengers affected will be offered either the option of a refund or being rebooked on another BA flight or potentially with another airline, but that isn't going to be much consolation for those looking at their uh, travel plans in autumn. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. We'll be talking more about uh, those flights that have been cancelled. And if you are unlucky enough to be caught up in that, what you can and can't do to try to get your money back and indeed salvage your holiday. That coming up with Simon Calder a little bit later on from the Independent newspaper. Meantime, Ukraine has rejected Russian allegations that it killed the daughter of one of President Vladimir Putin's allies. Daria Dugina was killed by a car bomb near Moscow on Saturday. Her father was believed to have been the target of the attack. Uh, let's talk about it in more detail. Uh, Ali is standing by in Odessa for us. And as we were saying yesterday, um, Alistair, it is thought that her father, who is often described as Putin's brain, was supposed to be the target of this attack. Yeah, I, I think that is a logical conclusion to come to uh, because he was, we understand, supposed to be travelling in that car and it was only at the very last minute that he decided to go uh, in a different vehicle uh, and because he is well known uh, for uh, voicing a, a lot of the Kremlin's thoughts and influencing some of the Kremlin's decisions, uh, it would seem logical that he was the target of that attack. His daughter was a, a pretty well known and uh, quite prominent uh, journalist in Russia as well who um, sympathised and echoed with a lot of his thinking. Um, but I think it probably is most likely that uh, he was the intended target. Russia opened a murder investigation into his death yesterday and then within a couple of hours said that they had concluded that it was Ukraine that was behind the attack. They said that a Ukrainian woman had travelled to... Moscow with her daughter, she carried out the explosion remotely and then fled across the Estonian border. Now, you, Ukraine rejects that out of hand. Um, whatever the truth is, I have to say it would be a massive leap forward for the Ukrainians to be able to carry out an operation like that uh, right in the centre uh, of Moscow. Uh, but Vladimir Putin has described the attack as an evil attack and now there are fears that they will want some sort of retribution above and beyond uh, the normal daily shedding that goes on here. And a focus of that could be tomorrow, which is Independence Day, marks the point that uh, Ukraine got independence from the Soviet Union, but also it marks the sixth month anniversary of this war. And the United States has released some intelligence saying that they are worried that the Russians could use tomorrow to launch some attacks, particularly on civilian and government infrastructure. Kyiv has banned all celebrations related to Independence Day as well uh, to protect the civilians there and there are some curfews around the country as well. Just before I let you go, Alistair, we were talking yesterday about grain, weren't we? Ships are starting to leave Odessa but uh, not in the numbers that is necessary at this stage. No, I don't think so. Uh, it has been seen as a diplomatic success, getting this agreement between Russia and Ukraine to allow cargo ships in and out of... There's about three ports around Odessa, one you can see behind me and the two sort of either side of it. Uh, and for sure, it, what it has done is it has alleviated uh, the problem to some extent. So because we're in harvest season at the moment, the great worry was that the grain silos that were already full just wouldn't be able to take any more grain and so you would have a ruined harvest this year but also the inability to shift grain around the world where it is desperately needed in particular parts of Africa and the Middle East. So yeah, the ships are coming in, we see them the whole time, not enough but, you know, better than it was certainly and they are trying to get them becoming more frequent and, and getting around the world. So a very rare diplomatic success in this war, uh, but they could be doing more would be the ideal situation. OK, thank you. Still to come on the programme for you, we will have more on the British Airways flight cancellations. As I said, speaking to Simon Calder, the travel journalist, about how to navigate through thousands more flight cancellations this winter. With barristers on strike over pay, we'll hear from one who says she earned more money as a barista. 
later on. Speaking to founder of Utilita Energy, uh, Bill Bollum, on how he's teaming up with Iceland to help people save money. Uh, meantime, some of today's other headlines for you. A host pipe ban has been introduced in Cornwall and parts of Devon today for the first time in 26 years. Southwest Water says it's been left with no other choice but to implement the measure to preserve supplies. Lawyers of former US President Donald Trump have asked a federal judge to stop the FBI from reviewing documents recovered during a search of his Florida home. They want a neutral official appointed to review the documents concerned. Federal investigators are looking into whether Trump took the materials illegally when he left office in 2021. Drug tests for Finland's Prime Minister have come back negative after a weekend of dancing and partying. She took the tests voluntarily following criticism from other politicians. Just high on life, there you go. Aren't we all? A report by Tony Blair's foundation says GCSEs and A-levels should be scrapped in favour of a new system which better prepares school leavers for the workplace. The Tony Blair Institute for Global Change says continuous forms of assessment between the ages of 16 and 18 could replace the current exams. OK, let's return to the Conservative leadership race now, joined by the chair of the Education Select Committee and Rishi Sunak supporter. That's Robert Halfen. Hello to you, Mr Halfen. Thanks for joining us on the programme. We've been hearing from energy companies over the last 24 hours. They want this leadership contest to end and the new Prime Minister to con uh, con um, concentrate, I should say, on what is happening as far as the cost of living crisis is concerned. Why doesn't your guy just throw his hat into the... Uh, Honestly, I can't even speak this morning. I don't know what's going. Give up, basically. Throw the towel in. That's the phrase I was looking for. Well, the contest is is not over until it's over. There's only a less than a couple of weeks to go before a new prime minister uh, is appointed. Uh, there have been different polls. Po polls of Conservative councillors have had Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss level plaguing. I think he's got an important programme for the country. I'm supporting him because I think he's trusted when times were tough and we saw that with the furlough scheme. I think that he's done a lot on the cost of living, providing uh, £1,200, up to £1,200 for 8 million of the most vulnerable uh, families. And I also support him because of what he's saying on education about having a British Baccalaureate, more support for vocational and technical education and more free schools. It may well be the case, but by any measure, he's miles behind in the contest. And we have a cost of living crisis where inflation could be up to 18% by January. It's all over for him. He just needs to accept that. I think that members have a right to have a choice of who they would like to have they as have Prime Minister. They had a choice and they've chosen Liz Truss, it would appear. The voting isn't over yet. There's some many, many members who haven't yet uh, voted. When Rishi goes around the country, he has a lot of support. I mentioned the poll of Conservative councillors, which showed both candidates uh, level playing. It's still all to uh, play for. It'll be over very uh, shortly, but it, you're absolutely right. Um, that uh, cost of living is the number one concern for the nation. And that's, again, why I'm supporting uh, Rishi Sunak, because he says we've got to cut inflation, which is the enemy of uh, uh, the cost of living. We've got to cut our national debt, because the government faces a triple whammy of public spending pressures, national uh, debt, and uh, helping with the cost of living. Um, you've got to deal with those things first before you can have significant tax cuts. Yeah, and to do that, you need to be Prime Minister. And the big beasts, Sajid uh, Javid, I'm looking at my list, Penny Mordaunt, Ben Wallace, Nadim Zahawi, Brandel Lewis, Kwasi Kwarteng, Therese Coffey, they're all supporting the other candidate. Well, big beasts like uh, William Hague, um, Nigel Lawson, no, and Michael are in the cabinet. Grant Shapps is in the cabinet, Stephen Barkley is in the cabinet, Mark Spencer is in the uh, cabinet. But this is not just about A-level celebrities, um, or, sorry, A-celebrities who are, uh, you know, who support the various leadership candidates. It's about the programme for uh, the country. And uh, I believe that Rishi Sunak has a responsible programme in cutting the cost of living, dealing with the debt, cutting inflation, then having a programme towards uh, income tax cuts. And, and we will need major interventions on the cost of living. We can't have uh, um, significant um, tax cuts yet because of the pressures on the public purse. 
if he cared, as you say, about um, the poorest in our society, he would acknowledge that the race is over and fall in behind Liz Truss, who by any measure is miles ahead in the polls, um, and accept that he's lost. I think it's right that the members have a choice. And I think Rishi Sunak has shown that he cares about the most vulnerable. He spent £37 billion when he was just Chancellor just a few months ago, trying to help people get through the cost of living, a £400 rebate for uh, everyone on their energy bills, £1,200 for 8 million of the most vulnerable families, a £150 rebate in council tax for most people, a national insurance tax cut in essence, for 70% of households. It's about what you do. And I think he is right um, to be able to have a chance uh, to set his programme, not just to the membership, but to the, the country. The contest will be over uh, very shortly. I think it's right that members have a choice. It's still all to play for. Haven't they had a choice so far? Well, the choice is that when uh, when when the membership votes and they're voting at the moment, not all the members have voted. There's still a couple of weeks to go. The candidates are going around the country. Rishi Sunak is coming to my own uh, constituency uh, in Harlow in a few in, in a few days, meeting uh, members, and that is the right thing to do. Um, you are, as I said, chair of the Education Select Committee. Um, what do you make of the report by the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change calling for the scrapping of GCSE and A-levels? Well, I believe for some time that we need to look at GCSE and A-levels, but particularly A-levels, because we allow students to narrow um, at the age of 16 down to just three or sometimes four for subjects. I've been to schools where they teach what is called the International Baccalaureate, where they do a wide variety of subjects. And I think that is a much better system uh, for the world we're entering, the world of automation, the world of artificial intelligence. I do think we need a much more skills-based education. I'd like to see more technical and vocational education taught all the way through and not have a dividing line between some students doing vocational education and some students doing academic. It should be a mixture of these, of these things. So I think some things in the Blair report are well worth looking at, but I should note that Rishi Sunak, we've been talking about, has also proposed a British baccalaureate uh, for from the age of 16, where students would do a much more wider variety of subjects, including maths and English, all the way through until they, they finish their, uh, their school. Yeah, and if I'd done my A-levels, I would have known the difference between throwing your hat in the ring and throwing in the towel. It's good to talk to you this morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Unsettled and humid this week, turning very warm in the south, but things should settle down over the weekend. Mostly fine and warm, but there's fog and drizzle on southwestern coasts and hills. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now to an awful lot of money disappearing between uh, beneath the waves, I should say. Take a look at this. Here we go. A super yacht going down in the Med. 40-metre long vessel ran into difficulty about 110 miles off the coast of Cantanzaro, which is in southern Italy. The Italian Coast Guard rescued all nine people on board, four passengers, five crew, but could do nothing to save the vessel. Goodness. If you ever watch Below Deck, I'm a big fan. You'll know exactly what it was like on that boat. Um, well, from sinking ships to grounded flights, we'll be talking about British Airways after the break. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to the programme. Top stories for you this morning. Government Minister Chloe Smith has told this programme that she opposes freezing the energy price cap, insisting that there needs to be a longer-term solution to soaring energy costs. Merseyside police have launched a murder investigation after a nine-year-old girl was shot dead in Liverpool. Two other people have been wounded. British Airways has cancelled 10,000 flights from its winter schedule between late October and March of next year. 
Well, earlier I was joined by the Government Minister and Liz Truss supporter, Chloe Smith. I asked her whether Ms Truss would support a potential freeze on the energy price cap, as mentioned by some energy bosses. I'm aware of those arguments and, in, and indeed, for example, also the Labour Party also makes the argument that actually there should be a, a, a type of a freeze. I worry that those are short term solutions only. So I think what we so do she's need not going to do. I think what we do need to look at is the longer term solutions about how to bring energy prices down. And there you need to think about energy security. And there you would also need to think, I think, about the ways that we uh, interact with somebody like uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia, whose actions have been a main part of driving those prices up and driving those pressures up. Tamara's here with us this morning, as always, of course. Good morning to you. What did you make of what the Minister had to say? Well, Liz Truss is being pressed again and again and again, Kay, on what help she's going to offer people with bills in the short term. Because, of course, while it's important that the West weans itself off Russian gas and potentially builds more nuclear power stations and all the other measures, it's important that people who are facing energy bills of £4,000 in January, in just a few months' time, get help with that. Now, Chloe Smith, the Minister for Disabled People, is talking about a £150 payment announced under the current government in May, which people will be getting soon. But the problem is, much of this support that was um, put together in May was intended for energy bills to reach about £2,800. They're going to get a lot higher than that, and we'll get a sense of that when we hear the cap on Friday. And yet, as she said, when you said, what is Liz Trust offering people in terms of immediate support. She said, I can't tell you that. You'll have to wait till September when and if she is Prime Minister. So she's still not wanting to set out what that would be, just saying she wants to prioritise tax cuts. And I thought that there was an admission there when you said to her, but they will only they will help people who are better off more than those at the bottom of the pile. An admission that that was the case, saying, yes, we may offer other support as well. We just can't tell you what it is. Yeah, and guidance um, from the OBR doesn't look as though That's right. That. So... Um, the Office for Budget Responsibility is sort of the independent watchdog set up by George Osborne. Every budget and autumn statement, they prepare a forecast saying this is how much the economy is growing, this is how much money, essentially, you have to play with. And they can also do them at other times. In fact, when I spoke to the OBR yesterday, they said if the new Prime Minister and Chancellor want a forecast, we can prepare them one for what Liz Truss was calling her emergency budget in September. Now, the Trust team don't want one. They'd initially suggested it might take too long to prepare after the OBR said they could prepare it quickly. Uh, they suggested that they didn't need it because it wasn't a proper budget and they're now calling it something else, calling it a fiscal event. So even though it's going to be quite massive, we're talking about reversing the national insurance rise, this is billions and billions of pounds, um, it sounds like they don't want the up-to-date numbers and the accusation from the SUNAC camp is that they don't want to know how much the public finances have deteriorated since we last saw these charts back in March. Mm. I wonder what a budget is if it's not a fiscal event. Well, she's trying to draw this distinction between a, a proper budget, which we still expect to have in November, and what she's doing now, something more targeted. But the fact that she doesn't want to have the forecast uh, suggests that, um, according to her critics, she may not want to know what's in them. Perhaps the biggest hint yet that Kwasi Kwarteng is uh, looking at the Chancellor's job. But we'll see. Uh, um, we've got tomorrow's take at nine o'clock. See you then. Look forward to it. Thank you. British Airways has announced it's cancelling up to 10,000 flights this winter and concerns are growing that other airlines will also announce mass cancellations. Joined now by the travel correspondent of The Independent, that's Simon Calders, the travel editor, of course. Forgive me there, Simon. Um, talk to me in more detail about what on earth is going on with uh, British Airways and I'm guessing with other airlines as well. Well, British Airways, by far the biggest carrier at uh, London Heathrow, has announced, or, well, they, they told the trade first, their agents and uh, holiday companies and so on. They said, right, we are going to be taking out yet more flights this winter. Now, you'll recall that um, at the start of the summer season, that was the end of March, all the airlines had great plans for the summer. For example, EasyJet said it was going to have its biggest ever programme from Gatwick. That soon fell apart and they uh, have cancelled thousands of flights. British Airways, which was getting back to pre-COVID levels at Heathrow, has so far cancelled about 30,000 flights. Um, there's another 1,250 uh, just been announced in the next uh, couple of months, which will take us to the end of the summer season. And then... In the winter, the uh, pressure should be off, cancelling 10,000 short-haul domestic and European flights. And uh, that represents, um, along with the uh, 
flights which are being taken out long haul as well. Fewer of those, uh, a few hundred of those, represents about two million seats taken out of the market. Now, you might think, well, that's great for the environment. And um, undoubtedly it is. But if you're a terror, if you're a passenger, it could be bad news. Yeah, absolutely. So what can you do? What are your rights? Well, if you're affected, and, and the whole idea by of making these cancellations now is that um, actually many of the flights won't have that many people booked on them, um, it's very straightforward. You could get a, ra a, a refund, but of course, the vast majority of people are actually going to want to travel where they want to go when they want to get there. Um, and therefore, British Airways will put you on one of its other flights. And um, in general, most of the cuts are going to be on routes where there are more than one flight a day so they can just sw switch you to another flight um, if for some reason there isn't another BA flight available then they have to put you on a different airline um, but the impact is going to be felt disproportionately I fear K on the domestic routes so that's from Belfast City from Aberdeen Inverness Glasgow Edinburgh Newcastle and Manchester those are flights which typically have lots of people connecting and I was just taking a look at, at, at what the cuts mean so a month today going from London Heathrow to Aberdeen where you'd normally expect six or eight flights a day from first thing in the morning till uh, last thing at night there are just two they're both in the evening and the lowest price at this stage is £215, whereas normally you'd expect to be able to pick something up for less than half that. And it's people in the regions of the UK who I think are going to be most affected. And you could find that, yeah, you've got a connecting flight from Heathrow, but you're actually going to be hanging around um, for many hours because uh, the flight you were on has been pruned. Uh, yeah. Uh, what about if you're flying long haul? Um, are those less likely to be impacted? Yeah, I mean, that's where British Airways makes the vast majority of its money and they will always protect the long haul schedule. There have been some cuts. So, for example, there's multiple flights every day to New York and certainly on some quiet days, they will they will fill it a few of those. Um, and uh, that probably won't mean more than an hour or two uh, difference between what you were planning to do. Important to say that um, at this stage, it doesn't look like anybody's going to be getting any cash compensation because they are aiming to give at least two weeks notice of these changes, which means they are not liable to pay out uh, any compensation uh, for the inconvenience. Um, but honestly, the amount of capacity that's being taken out means that anybody who is looking to travel will find that there is less choice and that uh, prices are higher, both on British Airways itself and, of course, on the competitors. EasyJet and Ryanair are picking up bookings all over the place because British Airways um, uh, is culling so many flights. But BA itself isn't losing out that much because overall price levels are going through the roof. Uh, to get here to Italy, I paid £300, which is roughly three times what I would have liked to have paid. Oh, well, at least you're in Italy. Enjoy it while you can. It's good to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, in a fortnight's time, we'll know who's to become the next leader of the Conservative Party and thus the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak head to Birmingham today as they aim to put the manifestos to Tory members in the Midlands. So what are the latest polls saying? Well, in the studio, political commentator and former president of YouGov, Peter Kellner. It's great to see you, as always. Morning, Kate. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Let's talk about the big lead for Labour to start with. We had a YouGov poll at the weekend which showed a Labour lead of 15 percentage points over the Conservatives. The biggest for nearly 10 years, if that were the election results, Labour would not just win, they would have a fairly comfortable overall majority. But whenever I see a single poll showing a sudden change, I say, is this real or is it a sampling fluke? Well, we've had two more polls since that YouGov poll, Opinion in Sunday's Observer and Redfield and Wilton out this morning. They disagree on the raw figures, but they agree absolutely that Labour's leaders shot up by five or six points in the last week or two. So in three polls by different companies, slightly different methods, all agree on the direction of travel, I think we can take it as real. OK, so this YouGov poll at the weekend gave Labour 43 points, the Conservatives um, down on 28 and the Lib Dems 11. 
Yeah, um, and remember, at the last general election, the Conservatives were on 45 percent across Britain. So they're now down 17 points. They've lost a third of their support. Um, they are in, I think, very, very deep trouble. I think when we talked to some weeks ago, I think I predicted that there would be a honeymoon for the new Tory Prime Minister. I'm not quite so sure that'll happen. The Conservative leadership campaign, I think, has done the party quite a lot of harm, and that's part of what we're seeing here. I had a Rishi Sunak supporter on the programme just a few moments ago, and he was saying it isn't all over. He's still uh, in the running, is he? Uh, no. Um, That's what I thought. But, but, but he would say that, wouldn't he? Mm, exactly. That's what I thought. Uh, talk to me about Labour's proposal for freezing energy bills. How's that looking? Well, here, I, I mean, you've got something quite remarkable happening. You've got the Labour's policy of freezing um, uh, bills. You have tested this amongst the general public last week and found overwhelming support for it, with 69% saying it's a good idea, just 13% saying it's a bad idea. Now, you, you do occasionally get that sort of division, but I can't remember the last time on a big controversial policy where leading members of one political party are on one side and the other party on the other side. I don't remember a figure that's one-sided. And I'm sure that's part of the reason why Labour's leader's been going up. Um, yeah, I, I mean, th that proposition by Labour means that everybody will benefit. It's not just uh, the worse off. So yeah, it's interesting. You can make so many... you can make a lot of comments or criticisms yeah. about it, whether it'll it's survive an observation, beyond it's six not months. A criticism. But but that's right. But 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 for the moment, it has clearly caught the public's imagination, and even conservative supporters overwhelmingly think it's a good idea. You know, if I were Liz Truss, I'd be quite worried that unless she can trump that with a policy that has even greater appeal she will look as if she's lagging behind Labour on catching the public well, we had a list trust supporter on the programme earlier on uh, this morning and it didn't look as though that they were going to adopt that, certainly for now. Uh, but who knows, she's been known to U-turn before. Who would you vote for as Tory leader was a question that was asked as well. Um, that's right. Well, the, the ghost of, 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 of Boris Johnson has been hanging over this contest, contest. So when you got last week polled Tory party members. Specifically, Just yeah. Specifically Tory party members. Supposing Boris Johnson were in the race, along with Liz Truss um, and Rishi Sunak, who would you vote for? And if you look at the figures, you see that Boris Johnson comes out miles ahead. 46% uh, for Boris Johnson. Uh, you see 46%... That's what Boris... Sellers' remorse looks like. It, it, it does. And there are signs from, from other polls that um, both amongst party members and perhaps now more importantly as we move forward amongst the general public, Liz Truss, some of the shine is becoming coming off Liz Truss's reputation. Um, opinion poll on, on Sunday should be amongst the public. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Liz Truss outranked Keir Starmer as best prime minister. Now Keir Starmer has moved into the lead over her. That's why I'm not quite so sure she'll get um, a honeymoon period. Of course, in the long run, how she performs as prime minister will determine it, not the reputation after the first few weeks. But she's, she's entering some trickier waters than I think we all expected a month or six yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, 18% inflation by January, potentially. Um, wider public, where does Boris Johnson sit there? Well, now, here's the thing. that um, when, you, um, when you ask the standard question, do you approve or disapprove of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister? This was a, an opinion uh, survey over the weekend. Boris Johnson's ratings are pretty terrible. Just a quarter of the public think he's uh, approve of his uh, role as Prime Minister, well over half disapprove. A and here's the thing. We saw that the Conservative support is down to 30%, give or take a point or two. Yeah. They've got to get back up to well over 40 to win the next election. A lot of the people who've deserted the Conservatives are people who feel let down by Boris Johnson's personality and performance and policies over the last couple of years. So if Liz Truss is appealing to the Conservative activists, she'll talk up Boris Johnson, say how much of a fan she is of his, because party members love him. But if she's trying to win back those lost voters, three, four million lost voters, they're not people who like Boris Johnson. So if she goes all pro-Johnson as Prime Minister, I think it'll make it harder for her to win back those three or four million votes she needs. Always great to see you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.
Now, Manchester United, the former kings of English football, kicked off again against uh, Liverpool last night, bottom of the table and on zero point. Thousands of fans had gathered outside at Old Trafford to protest, demanding the club's owners give up control. None of them expected what happened next. Here's Rob. We won't play south, and we won't play south. Match day at Old Trafford and Red Devils fans are raging, marching on their stadium in a show of dissent. The love for their club is enduring. The loathing has so long around here is targeted at Manchester United's owners. The Glazers blame for the nine years without winning the Premier League and five years without any trophy at all. The visit of Liverpool, one of United's biggest rivals, uses the platform of protest after starting the league with back-to-back -back defeats. The unveiling of another signing, not enough to dampen the anger. £60 million midfielder Casemiro, a 30-year-old arriving from Real Madrid, nodded his peak. The club in the Sir Alex Ferguson heyday had no debt before the Glazers' takeover. Now it's nearly £600 million. Servicing the debt has cost more than a billion pounds in 17 years. There has been over £1.1 billion spent net on transfers. The fans chanting outside Old Trafford missed the drama inside the stadium. Cristiano Ronaldo dropped from the starting lineup. His replacement, though, coming so close to grabbing the opener. It wasn't long before United did take the lead for the first time this season. Still Sancho, cool as you like. Everything was going right for once for United. Marcus Rashford scores. Mohamed Salah ensured a nervy conclusion for United, but too little, too late for Liverpool. Eric Ten Hag, the fifth full-time manager since Ferguson, finally has his first win as United manager. How fortunes can change in 90 minutes. Now it's Liverpool, the team, still without a win after three matches. And the United faithful who arrived here at Old Trafford protesting today leave celebrating the players, but certainly not the owners. We love United, but we want Glazers out. If you've got a failing business, it's always the boss that needs to get the brunt of everything rather than the players. I know the players ain't been that great. I think we had the right players on the pitch tonight. That's my point of view. Good win, but it, it doesn't oversee the protest, really. Then We need to get rid of them. But I was expecting us to get a smash, but luckily we didn't. The hope is not only the silverware returns, but that the Glazers aren't the owners celebrating here too. Rob Harris, Sky News, Old Trafford. Just remind me who's top of the league? Oh, yeah, the Arsenal. Criminal barristers in England and Wales have voted in favour of an all-out strike in their deepening dispute with the government over jobs and pay. Let's show you part of what this dispute is all about. Here we see the pay scale. Here we go, ranging from very junior barristers right up to the most experienced. So at the top end of the scale, barristers with up to 27 years' experience earn more than £97,000 per year. Compare that with barristers who are just starting out. They make less than £13,000 a year. Joining us now is Rosalind Bergen. She's a junior barrister at Garden Court North Chambers. Hello to you, Rosalind. Thanks for joining us. What kind of disruption will this strike, which is kicking in from the 5th of September, have on the court process? Yes, well, um, we've been on a on and off strike for much of the year, starting in April. Um, but as negotiations, the government refuses to to budge on their nonsensical offer. We're now escalating to all out strikes. So that is no attendance at criminal defence crown court trials. So what, what, what impact will that actually have on the court system? What does that mean if um, a trial that was due to, you know, that somebody's waited two years for a trial to come up, uh, it will just be postponed indefinitely or what happens? Yes. Yes, that's, that's completely right. When we can't attend court until something is done to address the crisis, it's incredibly painful. I mean, I, when I, I fully, fully support the ballot. I fully support the strike action. But I felt sick reading the result yesterday because, yeah, I think of my clients who are going to, you know, going to delay even further as a result of the strike. But we didn't create that crisis. We didn't create that situation. We're striking because we're out of other options to address it. Yeah, but some, I mean, you, you, you touch on it there. Some of these cases are victims of, let's say, violent uh, crime. How, how must they be feeling knowing that their justice or the hope of justice may be indefinitely delayed? Well, you know, I interact with these people on, on a daily basis. Um, the, these are not abstract concepts to me. I'm very close to these people. And, I mean, the backlog was 41,000 in March 2020, pre-pandemic. The backlog is 58,000 in July 2022. 
that was already the case, and that's why we're striking. Um, I went to court yesterday. It was in a civil case. It wasn't in a criminal case, so it wasn't someone that's that's been affected by the strikes, but still someone very vulnerable, waiting for justice, someone accused of something who's maintaining their innocence. I turned up and said good morning, and he said, what are you doing here? You should be on strike, because he fully supports what we're doing, because people who experience the criminal justice system want someone to represent them who's able to do the job and being able to do the job means being paid means not having to take on a crazy amount of workload so to answer your question it's for those people that we're striking not not despite of them they're the motivation certainly for me and i know for a lot of my colleagues um not what the justice secretary would be saying he's written uh, to the daily mail today being very critical of barristers Yes, I'm, I'm sure he has. Um, what we're trying to do is raise the alarm and do something about the crisis that has been long running in the criminal justice system. Um, our demands are pretty modest in the context of the cuts that the criminal justice system has faced. Um, if, if there are any other alternatives for the court backlog, um, I'd be keen to hear them. But at the moment, the government has just not given anything back. Um, if you can hear them, if you can get through to them to get any kind of breakdown of why they think their offer is justifiable, then uh, you'll be doing better than us. Um, the uh, the next, as you said, you've been on strike on and off for most of the year, but this big strike is uh, from the 5th of September. Now, there is also another event happening on the 5th of September, as my viewers will know. It's when we find out who our new prime minister will be. Um, have you chosen that date specifically? Um, I, I can't say so. I, I'm not that not as far as I'm aware. Um, but I do think this upheaval in government is a good opportunity for a new leadership to come in and just get this over with. Just finish this. There's been a legacy of cuts, a decimation of the criminal justice system. If this, you know, this government keeps saying it's tough on law and order, we've got an average of 700 days delay for trials, 1500 days delay for sexual assault cases. <laughs> what are they doing? Um, I think it would be a very smart move of any new leader of any party party coming in to resolve this on day one. The cost in proportion is not that much. We're asking for, I think, less of an investment than what the government has made in selling off the court estate in the last, last decade. It's really would be very easy and very quick to fix. So I hope this government turmoil leads to whoever comes in next, just sorting this out straight away. Nice, easy win as soon as they start. Um, just remind us what you want. So our demands are for an increase to the advocates' fees, so that's our barristers' fees that we get per case, by 25% for claims submitted on or after 11th of April 2022. So, I mean, this is in the context of a 28% cut in our income over the past 16 years. So <laughs> we're still asking for less than what it has been cut by. Um, we're also asking for pay for written work as recommended by the independent review, index linking and independent pay review body require, um, as similar to what MPs have. They're the demands. The government keeps saying that they've offered us a 15% pay rise. I really wish it would stop getting reported without question that that's what they've offered because it's just not true okay. the um offer let's have a look at it it's it will come well, in unfortunately we can't unpack it right now because we are out of time but we have done that previously on the program and i'm sure we will do it again it's great to talk to you thank you very much indeed for joining us thank you thank you coming up in just a few moments time we're going to be taking you back to liverpool where a young girl has been shot dead overnight uh, two adults um are seriously ill in hospital. It's thought to have been uh, within a property in this street in Liverpool in Nottingham. The little one was just nine years old. The latest on that coming up in just a few moments' time. Also, we are going to be talking about the cost of living crisis. The latest scary figures for us are 18% inflation by January. Goodness, stay tuned.